One of the worst things that you can do when building a web application is serve images that are way too big and aren't optimized for your users. So in this video, I'm going to show you a few different ways you can optimize your images, including doing dynamic transformations using ImageKit. So let's go ahead and get into it. What's going on, everyone? My name is James Kuquick, and I do weekly videos on web development related topics. And in this video, we're specifically going to talk about image optimization and how to make sure that you don't send images to a user or to a browser that are too big. We always want to send basically as small an image as we can for two different reasons. If you try to send back really big images, and we'll see this in a second, it will slow down the experience for the user. So if the browser is trying to load this really big image, it's going to have to take time to do that. Now, the other thing is it's also going to use extra bandwidth for the user. So if they're on their phone and they have maybe not an unlimited amount of data, you don't want to be sending down these really big files because that's going to be data that they're going to have to ultimately pay for. So several different reasons why these images should be optimized. We're going to cover a few different ways to optimize them in this video, including using ImageKit as a sponsor today. So what we're going to do is eventually upload images to ImageKit and use their dynamic transformations in the URLs to get different versions or different sizes of our image without us having to do any of the work. So we'll see that hands-on in a second. Let's go ahead and dive into the demo. We can see this progression of starting with really unoptimized, really big images, all the way down to the appropriate image for the appropriate size. So let's get into it. All right, so what I've got open here is an image gallery. And notice I've got it in responsive mode in here. So if you go to, in Chrome, the kind of device toolbar button over here and then change to responsive. This allows me to uh, move this around and I want to do this so that I can show you what this uh, gallery looks like on different screen sizes. So let's take a look really quickly at the code here. This is kind of a dynamically generated gallery inside of JavaScript where I uh, create an array of indices indexes from one to 10. I iterate through each one and then I create an image element for each one and then add in the source property to link to the appropriate image in this images folder. This is all just vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So hopefully it's relatively straightforward. And then the last thing we do is add an event listener to the individual images so that when we click them, we can then see them in a full screen pop-up. If you're interested in creating a vanilla JavaScript, HTML, CSS gallery like this, I've got a video that will be up in the next day or two. I'll make sure to add a card up here so you can go and check it out. But that's the demo that we're gonna be working with. Now, if I open this up a little bigger, um, I want you to see when I refresh this page and I'm not throttling my network connection or, or anything, but you see there's some loading time with those images, right? Like you get part of it, but not the whole thing. And if we go and look inside of these images and hover on one of these network requests, so I've got to open the network tab and then the image filter here. If we hover on one of these, it's making a request to uh, a local folder that I'll show you in a second. And the request comes back at 2.6 megabytes in size, which is huge for an image. And what I did was these are the cover images for our Compressed FM podcast, weekly episodes on web development and web design. If you're interested, these are the topics that you can see. These are the cover images that in Figma are just really, really big to start. So they're 3000 by 3000, huge images. We almost never will need that. We'll usually export that at a smaller size or, or do some of the tricks that we'll show you here in a second. So these images by default are just huge. And this is inside of a project, an image gallery I've got inside of VS Code. And inside of images, I've got each one of these images listed here. Again, they're huge. They're 3,000 by 3,000. So one of the things that we could do is we could kind of compress some of these images. Compress, compressed FM. There's a pun for you. Uh, but in this, you look at these images, since there's a lot of uh, a lot of pixels in here that are the exact same color, look at all the black and the yellow and stuff like that. It's really actually pretty easy to compress these things to get smaller sizes. So one trick, one thing you should always do is run these through something like tiny PNG. And what I did is I uploaded all of these images and then uh, it will give me back a smaller image about 78% smaller. So it went from 2.6 meg megabytes to 567 kilobytes. That makes it a lot smaller. So after I did that, I put those images inside of the compressed folder, again, compressed. And uh, once we swap that out, let's add in the slash compressed to this. So if we do slash compressed and then our cover image, the application will look the same, but the images that are coming down are smaller. And there should hopefully be a little less loading time in there. But regardless, we see that these in this bottom right here 
are 584 kilobytes. So now significantly smaller than what it was when it was 2.3 or whatever it was meg. So we're already a lot smaller. These should already be a lot quicker, but we can really take this to the next level by using today's sponsor of our video, ImageKit. So what we're gonna do, or what I've already done, is sign up for a free account with ImageKit. You should do the same. And then I uploaded all 10 of those original images, the really big ones, the 3000 by 3000, you can see that in here. I uploaded all 10 of those. Now, alternatively, instead of uploading them directly to ImageKit, I could integrate ImageKit with several other different providers, something like an Amazon S3 bucket, uh, Azure, Blob Storage, Google Storage, Firebase Storage, Cloudinary buckets. So there's a few different ways that you can connect your images, but in this one, I've uploaded my images directly to ImageKit itself. And now what we can do is use uh, the URLs from ImageKit to be able to do some really neat stuff. So let's take a look at what this is. Let's go back to our source code and let's replace this image source now with a source that's coming from ImageKit. I'm gonna grab the URL and update this image source with that one. All right, so we're updating this image source. And by the way, inside of this code, what it's doing is just iterating through one through 10, creating the image and then adding it to the gallery. So in here, we're setting the source for that image. So we're starting by uh, setting this image to use uh, the URL that comes from ImageKit. So you have uh, ik.imagekit.io slash, and then kind of your space name. My name is James Q. Quick. And then the specific image that we're looking to reference. Now, usually when you upload these to ImageKit, they'll give you like a little suffix, like a random string. I got rid of that. I edited all these to keep the format similar to how I had them stored locally, where it's just cover, underscore, underscore, episode, and then dash, and then a number of the episode. So let's take a look at what happens when we do this. Let's save, let's come back to our application. It will refresh and now it's loading these images. Notice the loading there uh, took a lot less. So if you, uh, there was no like half loading state of the images, it took a lot less. And if we look in here, not only are these a little bit smaller, they're now 401 KB as opposed to the 580 KB. They're a little bit smaller and you might be wondering how, because the images that we uploaded to ImageKit were uh, were the really big ones, the 3000 by 3000, and they were the uh, two something meg, however big those were. However big those original images were, that's how big we uploaded to ImageKit. But one of the things it does, if we expand this, is this is no longer serving back a JPEG file. It's coming back as a type WebP. So we're making the request to this JPEG file but it's sending back a WebP format. WebP is a format that is now pretty commonly used in browsers. I We'd have to check, let's actually look. Can I use WebP? Let's see how widely supported this is. All right, looks like we've got pretty good support over here um, from all of all the major, major browsers. Um, but the key here is that not all browsers support this. But WebP is a really highly optimized format that ImageKit didn't transform this image at all yet. It just realized it could send back a better format for this image. So by taking that really big one and changing it to WebP, now it's even smaller than when we ran this through the tiny PNG, that compression earlier. Now, not all browsers support this. So what ImageKit is able to do is when we make a request to ImageKit, ImageKit is going to decide based on that request whether or not their browser can handle something like WebP. So if it gets a browser that can't handle WebP, it'll send back the original JPEG. So we've already got a lot of optimization here by sending back WebP instead of that original JPEG file. But we can take this another step further by using image transformations with ImageKit. And what this means is you get this dynamic URL or you get a URL that can then be dynamic. And so what we do is we have our URL endpoint. We talked about this with mine, this James Q Quick in here. Then we can add in transformations in here before referencing the image that we're looking for. So what we can do is instead of loading the full image, which is 3000 by 3000, we can tell ImageKit, give me a version of this image that is maybe only 600 pixels wide. What ImageKit will do the first time we make that request is it will generate an image, a version of that image that is 600 pixels wide. It will then cache that image and save that image so that subsequent requests can request and get it back faster. So it's kind of creating on-demand dynamic images for us that then subsequently are much faster and easier to load. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Inside of this URL, before our episode uh, image here, we can do another slash. 
and we do a TR for transformation. So we're saying this is going to be a transformation. And then what we'll do is we'll use a width of 600 here. So we'll do our TR colon and then width dash 600. So what we're saying is give me the image. It will give me the optimized format of this image, but also we'll go ahead and transform it to a width of 600. So this is really cool. So now let's watch, let's save this and let's refresh again. Let's come back to the application. Let's make sure this refreshes. If we look at these now, we went from what was 405 KB, now down to 46 KB. Smaller image, still coming back in WebP format, and basically looks the exact same. If you look at these, you I don't think you could tell a difference in the quality of this image, especially on this size, because we're only displaying it at a max size of, I forget exactly how big these can be, somewhere around 600 as this scales up and down. So because of that, we're getting an optimized image, not only optimized in terms of size by using that transformation, also optimized in terms of format by getting it back in WebP. Again, nothing I had to do, all we had to do was upload these images to ImageKit and then swap out this URL. Now it gets even cooler. What if you want multiple different versions of this image? And this comes from the idea that if we have an image gallery, probably what you're used to is you can click on one of these images and then get a full screen pop-up. So if we do this, if we do this full screen pop-up, now we can see this bigger image. And right now this is loading the really big 2.6 megabyte image because it's loading the original one that's embedded inside of my code. Uh, inside of the images directory. So what if we wanted to update this to then use uh, the image kit URL as well? So we could come in and potentially say, hey, instead of uh, the image uh, source being that one, let's paste this in and update this. So this is going to be our selected image. All right. And instead of this being 600, let's say we just assume this thing is gonna be a little bit bigger. So this is going full screen. So let's go ahead and get just a bigger image here in 800. So now let's save this, let's refresh. Let's click on one of these to get the detailed image. Now we see this is coming back at 72 kilobytes. Again, significantly smaller than our 2.3 or 2.4 uh, megabytes that it was a second ago. So we're already winning, but what if, we could, what if we could request different versions of this image, different sizes of this image based on the width of the screen that's available to us and then the pixel density of the screen that we're looking at? This is where source set comes in. And source set is really neat. I had to do a little bit of research in, uh, in uh, how source set works to make sure I was comfortable with it to do this demo. There's a great video by uh, Kevin Powell, a friend of mine, who uh, has a video on source set and size attributes. Definitely recommend checking this out if you want some more details. We'll walk through the basics here of just how we're gonna get different size images based on the pixel density and the size of the screen. So let's come back to the code and I'm gonna copy in another snippet here or a few lines. I'm gonna paste this under where we set the source and then I'm gonna uncomment these. All right, so what this is doing is we're setting the source set property of this selected image and source set property is used to define multiple different images that you might want to display based on a couple of factors with the browser. So what we do is we say, hey, here's a version of this image that uh, we request to be 400 width. Again, the dynamic attributes or dynamic transformations with ImageKit allow us to do this. Uh, that one is also, it's gonna be, we're telling the browser in this case, it's a width of 400. Then we have another version that we request the 800 pixel width version from ImageKit. And we tell the browser, this is a width of 800. And then you probably get the idea. We have another version that is 1200 and then it display or it's width telling the browser is 1200 as well. So we're able to define these dynamic transformations using these uh, little things in the URL to get the specific size of the image that we want. And then we tell the browser, hey, based on these properties that we're telling you, the widths that we're defining for these images, you figure out which one makes the most sense based on the device, its pixel density, and its width. Super, super cool stuff. So let's take this out, um, or let's uh, not take this out, let's save it. Uh, one last thing to say is uh, the source attribute in this case will now be a default. So if source set is not uh, used by the browser, if the browser doesn't support source set, it will use the original source property as a backup. So it's good to go ahead and set that property for source and then also set your source set property so that you get the uh, correct image on the right size, right pixel density. All right, let's save this. Let's come back to our application. 
uh, we are in right now a pixel density of one. So density per density pixel ratio, I guess is what that is. I had a, yeah, there or device pixel ratio. So this is a 1.0, which means we should get a lower uh, version of image depending on how wide our screen is. So let's go and do this smaller. Let's uh, pick one of these. Let's look at this. This is uh, requesting the 800. So you can see that in the URL below. And then if we come and make this bigger, let's see, we might get a bigger image here. So this is requesting the 1200 just because it's bigger. We also could potentially change the pixel density to let's say a three. Let's refresh the page here. If we even make this smaller, even though it's smaller with the pixel density being so high, we now are getting that 1200 as well. So that's really neat. If we were to take this back down and then do a pretty small, not that small of a screen. Let's see, maybe this small. Uh, now let's test it. Let's do a refresh and I uh, click on the image and see this is getting the 400. So you saw the 400, the 800 and the 1200 and the browser is able to choose the appropriate one based on the source set. And again, we're able to define these different widths of images based on the fact that image kit gives it to us in the URL. And just to kind of reemphasize what this looks like, if I go to this URL in the browser with this being the Oh, I can't, uh, I can't do uh, interpolation for variables inside of here. Let's just do episode one. Uh, you can see this is a relatively small image. I can go up to the 800 image. I can go up to the 1200 image. And then honestly, a common thing that people do for that uh, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy load, the lazy load with images is serve a really, really small image as it's loading the bigger one. So if we did this down to like 100 pixels, you'll see this is tiny. And actually, even if we maybe put it down to like 16 pixels, this is going to be a super pixelated version of this image when we zoom in. So if we were doing kind of like lazy loading, fuzzy to clear images, like the blurred effect with images, we could serve something that's really small and then update it with the URL for the big one and swap those out. It's really neat how that works. And Image Kit provides us the ability to do all of that with these transformations inside of the URL. Now, I uh, only played around with the transformations with width. In Image Kit, if you look at the transformations, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can do width and height, you can do crop, you can uh, select the quality of the image, you can select the focus of the image, uh, the smart cropping here, you can do overlays, you can overlay a watermark or an image or a piece of text. You can do all sorts of really cool stuff, but we used Image Kit today to do some serious optimization around our images to make sure that you're only sending the appropriate and minimal size to the user that you can get away with. All right, hopefully that it helped you understand how to optimize your images and serve more performant applications to your users. Thankfully, Image Kit was able to help us do all of this by doing dynamic transformations and resizes, as well as choosing the optimal image format to send down to the browser like we saw with the WebP. So make sure to give ImageKit a try for image optimization. In the meantime, let me know what you're doing on your websites as you pay attention to its performance and making sure that your user experience is top notch. Thanks as always for checking out the video and I'll catch you next time.